Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here at the Halifax International Security Forum in Nova Scotia, Canada, one of the world's most important gatherings of national security, economic, diplomatic, and thought leaders from around the globe. Our coverage on this 10th anniversary of this extraordinary show uh, forum is sponsored by L3 Technologies and Leonardo DRS. And we're talking to Rafal Rohozinski, uh, who is the CEO of the Sectev uh, Group, uh, a key uh, player in the entire cyber AI uh, ecosystem. Uh, there was a fascinating uh, breakfast conversation uh, this morning. All of that was off the record, but we've agreed to, to speak on things that were not uh, off the record uh, part of that. Uh, look, you know, one of the things is that we, the whole world looked at the opening up the internet. It's going to flourish democracy. It's going to empower peoples around the world. It's going to be an um, inexorable force for good. It will change China. It will change Russia. And yet technology changed and now all of a sudden the very technologies that we're enabling are being used for suppression. Talk to us a little bit about the yin and yang of this as somebody, you know, you've been involved in this ecosystem from the very beginning. Yeah, well I think this is something that ties in really great with the, what we've been discussing here in Halifax in the last three days, which is, you know, are we actually winning? You know, has our investment into liberal democracy paid off? And if not, why, why potentially won't it? And technology has been a very important part of it. I mean, let's, let's, let's face it, that since the end of the Cold War, we've seen the single largest empowerment of individuals to do more things in more places anywhere else. And largely, it's been based upon the fact that people can now communicate globally, be part of the global supply chain globally, become part of communities that scale largely or larger where they live, and that's been the internet. The challenge, however, is that the internet is no longer just us idealists, the say the like-minded. The, the internet now is everybody. You know, when you recognize we have two-thirds of humanity online, that the vast majority of new users are coming from countries which are either affected by fragility or, or have governance problems, where the populations are below 25 years of age, more than 50% of the online population is that way, we recognize that the demographic of the internet has changed. It's not so much that the technology isn't empowering, but it's now served to empower people in different ways. And some of those ways aren't necessarily the same normative values that we think the technology should have been put to use for. Uh, so what, what can uh, free societies in the world do about that at the end of the day? Um, because, uh, you know, it's great that we all have supercomputers in our pocket, mm. but we're also finding that those supercomputers can be used for nefarious ends and affect populations in mass effect that mm. we've never been able to experience in the past. Right, so I think we, we have to start with the fact that we actually have a challenge of governance over this technology. Um, if we take a look at how automobiles were introduced into the roadways of the United Kingdom uh, at the beginning of the last century, who was responsible for rules? Well, it was, automobile drivers and automobile associations because it was felt that the only they had enough knowledge to be able to govern it. Well, we're sort of in that same stage right now with the internet. Looking back at it from the perspective of today, no one would give automobile associations the right to set rules. It's now a public responsibility. And yet somehow in cyberspace, we haven't come to a level of maturity to recognize that there has to be an accountable system that balances community security, government interests with this wonderful infrastructure that we have. Um, and that's challenging because up to now the internet has flourished as an instrument for freedom because we've had this multi-stakeholder approach which has essentially meant that there isn't a single sense of government, that it doesn't sit in one particular group, that effectively the technology can, can emerge organically and grow organically in ways that isn't regulated easily or trivially by governments. But as it's become the center of mass you know, in most economies, as it's become meaningful politically, Coming up with rules of the road that on one hand preserve you know, the, the freedom, the empowerment that the internet has, but on the other hand also provide for that modicum of community security, that's the challenge. And the challenge there exists because there are two models. There's our model, which we felt is the one that has no regulation, and then there's a model that's been put forward by countries such as China and Russia who feel that governments should have a, a, a recourse or somewhere to have accountability for governance of this space. When we look at the latter, we feel that maybe then what we're doing is turning this technology into something which favors authoritarian states for control. And that's where, for us, the challenge is coming up with a model of governance which is light enough, light enough to prevent that, but at the same time hits that modicum of community security. 
Um, we, the United States is, uh, tends to be bipolar about technology. Either we've got the best and we are the best, or oh my God, you know, we're, we're getting our butts whooped. So now we're sort of in the, uh, we're not the best at AI, we're not the best at cyber, we're not, you know, you look at China, look at Russia, and they're accelerating, and there are reasons, and I thought that was very astute of you, why the Russian cyber ecosystem is, is accelerating the way it is. Talk to us a little bit about how the United States, I mean, this is really a great power struggle in this space as well. How is that evolving? How does the United States stack up? And what are some of the strategic decisions that the United States and its allies have to make mm. if we want to maintain a degree of superiority in a field that our potential adversaries are already weaponizing in a lot of ways? Right. So I, I think you know one of the things that we need to recognize is that technology's adoption isn't just based upon innovation, the great idea, but there's an economic prerogative about it as well. When a technology becomes cheap enough to become employable as a substitute for other processes, that's when it spreads. And certainly, if we're looking at competition with countries like China in particular, that mass means that we're not going to win that race. The economics of employing AI at the scale that it needs to be employed in order to become pervasive will always be advantageous to the actor that has the, the largest mass to be able to do it. The other part of innovation, however, though, is coming up with new models. In other words, you know, as a professor once told me when I was at university, if you're in an intractable argument, change the topic, right? So I think where we have a competitive advantage is by changing the topic. We have to recognize right now that most of what AI is built on currently is still theoretical work that occurred in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, supercharged by the fact that we now have access to more data and greater computational power. But there are other ways in which these technologies could be evolved, which includes embedding them with certain values which we haven't thought of yet. GDPR is a really good example. A lot of people in the commercial sector will say, well, GDPR is all about compliance, you know, it's another prohibition, it's never going to work. But if you look at what GDPR says from a point of view of a blueprint for architecting new ways of dealing with data, architecting new systems which aren't dependent upon inhaling huge amounts of data and coming up with statistical patterns, but actually minimizing data. In other words, using pattern of life on the least amount of data collected. Well, you can actually create a value proposition which is different than the one that currently China has stacked all its bets on in terms of AI. And uh, Russia has gotten good at this because of sanction. Well, this is the paradoxical thing. This is the argument that I think we start to look at in terms of what is the actual strategic utility of sanctions. Are sanctions something that we can use as an instrument to compel better behavior? And the example of sanctions on Russia is, I think, good in terms of saying why that doesn't work. So in the last year, we were involved in doing some work for the World Bank on the digital economy strategy of the Russian Federation. We had a chance to kind of look at you know, what the actual tangible changes that have happened. And one of them that was very clear, the technological sanctions against Russia have meant that import substitution has made it possible and viable for them to actually lift up industries which previously had languished for a long time. Not only have we seen those industries really start to pick up, but their implementation in economic se sectors has actually seen beneficial growth in those sectors themselves. So we have to ask ourselves the question, you know, if we actually want to compel behavior, maybe better entanglement, maybe cooperation is the way to do that, rather than actually creating the basis for a more autarkic, balkanized uh, technological view where we simply will not be able to influence in quite the same way normatively. Um, I, I like entanglement, you know, the quantum uh, entanglement. Uh, but anyway, that's for the theoretical physics uh, version of this show. Um, the Chinese, there's also a big misunderstanding about China and its model. There's this tendency of believing sort of plotting communist state. And the model is radically different, isn't it, in terms of how the Chinese are using the stolen technology, but also their own resources to innovate their way to a brighter future mm. with people who are educated in all the best universities in the world, whether Caltech, MIT, or Cambridge. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And I, I think, you know, Misunderstanding or underestimating China's strategic intent is very, very dangerous. You know, we, we here in Canada are particularly sensitive around this because of the consequences of us not managing China's interference in terms of theft of IP 12 years ago. And here's the example. Currently, the Canadian government is considering whether or not to buy 5G technology from China, and there's a great debate over whether or not there's a, there's a, strategically, a strategic question about whether that makes sense or not. We forget, or we're just being reminded of the fact, that the patents that currently underlie most of the 5G technologies were developed by a co company called Nortel. 
which in the 1990s was the ninth largest corporation in the world and which was a repository of over 45 years of government investment into telecommunications here in Canada. That company was subject to a 12-year-long cyber espionage campaign that basically robbed it of its IP. When it went bankrupt, it sold its patentable assets back to the very same Chinese companies that had been robbing it previously for a paltry $6.5 billion. Okay? The fact that we're now dealing with a strategic choice over 5G where we cannot find a secure supplier is directly linked back to that. And China's long game in terms of staking out telecommunications is one of the commanding heights of the digital economy is what we're seeing now unfold in front of our eyes. But also that their technology development model is a lot more freewheeling and a lot less constraining than people think. Talk to us about how the Chinese throw everybody in the pool and manage to like winnow them down before they sort of pick the winners. Well, I, think, I think Mao put it best, let a thousand flowers, the million flowers bloom. The same thing actually uh, applies to the way that their technology selection works. You know, they're, they're ready to let you know, the, the, the bloody nose, broken limb fist fights occur among their startups before choosing the, the horse that they want to back. But equally important to recognize is that once they choose a, ho a, a horse to back, Choosing not to back that horse becomes really difficult because of the way that they actually go about choosing it. So their ability to choose right in terms of who to back as opposed to who to choose wrong is, is, is subject to the law of uh, probabilities. Um, let me ask you one last question, that's about security. Um, everybody is talking about cybersecurity. Folks are talking about uh, intrusion protection. I know this debate has been going on forever. Right. Do we need higher standards? No, we don't want government involvement. Well, it's an undue burden on small firms. And what we're finding is because we don't have some of these real ironclad standards, the security levels are uncertain. Big guys get penetrated. Mm and some of the information that secure big guys give to smaller guys are then penetrated, so ultimately the result is the same. What is the ecosystem-wide approach that's necessary for, uh, give us a little bit of a historical primer on like how we got here, but also sort of what has to be next, because part of it is rules of the road and part of it is technological. Right, well, I think the important thing to recognize is that the entire edifice of the global digital economy, everything that we depend on in terms of efficiency that we've gotten through the use of ICT systems is based fundamentally on a technology that was never built for security. It was built for resilience. If you had attended a conference of technologists 15 years ago that dealt with the internet, nobody was talking about security. They were talking about how do you make these systems work and work reliably. That means that anything that we try to do to secure this infrastructure is essentially a hack. And because we have limited ways of being able to measure behavior or anomalous behavior online, the reality is that most of our efforts of being able to secure cyberspace fall far, far short of the kinds of promises that cybersecurity companies will make. Add to that to the fact that 90% of all breaches happen because of a human factor. You recognize that you cannot build a cybersecurity product that engineers the human soul in, in that respect. On top of that, we also have a problem with the fact that this cybersecurity industry or this IT industry in a whole is largely absent of the same kind of consumer protections that would compel security as do uh, traditional manufacturing. If I was to build a car, I need to build an airbag, I need to make sure that I have a seat belt, I need to make sure that the person who's using it is not going to get hurt. If I'm buying an IT product, because I am essentially leasing it, those consumer protections don't exist. There's nothing to compel security at the level of the actual products that we use day to day. The other important thing is that because of the way that the internet is currently governed as a global network, absent of rules of the road, we essentially have no mechanism for being able to deal with insecurity at a state to state level. And as a result, we have a system that up and down the chain of, of, of value really is largely broken or unreformed. And again, it comes down to coming down with rules of the road and then looking at the appropriate technological measures to be able to enforce it. Uh, do you think, and, and last thing, do you think that Russia and China would be receptive to that in part because of our capabilities? I mean, is there sort of a deterrent Cold War stalemate that can be engineered on this? So I think it's important to recall that it was actually the Russian Federation that raised the whole issue of coming up with rules of the road in cyberspace in 1997 within the UN. Uh, we tend to underestimate the fact that the most important thing for both the Chinese and the Russians is regime stability. They are legalistic systems. They like rules because it creates predictability. The fact that we've not been able to engage in a rule discussion with them points to a bit of a failure on our side to recognize that there was a strategic opportunity to be able to set that minimum threshold of assurance where everybody can play on an equal field.
Rahal Rohozinski uh, of uh, the SecDev Group. Thanks very much. Absolute pleasure. Uh, enjoyed the conversation and, and would love to keep talking about these important issues. Pleasure. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thanks.